Welcome to Watermark's Church Leadership Podcast, a conversation with church leaders for church leaders. My name is John McGee. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, welcome back. I'm joined in the studio today by Jonathan J.P. Pakluda. J.P., welcome, brother. What's up, my guy? <laughs> yeah, hey, you done came up, man. This uh, The podcast studio, last time I was here, uh, let me just say in one word, upgrade. Upgraded, I think yeah. we were like in a closet in a closet. Something, and, yeah. And uh, this studio would rival just about anything I've ever seen, so wow. Well, that means a lot coming from you, because I feel like you are, you know, Mr. Social Media. You guys you guys have got a really uh, popular podcast down in Waco. So those of you guys that don't know, I'm assuming everyone does, but many do not. Uh, JP was on staff here for a long time, uh, led the porch, our young adult ministry, and then led this uh, Dallas campus that you're sitting in yeah. uh, now, and uh, is now the pastor at Harris Creek. He's an author, he's a speaker, and a really good friend. Wore black for a long time when you left, uh-huh. but you're back. We've been, but, I've been waiting on the front porch, hey, man. The prodigal's I'm, come home. I'm the only one in black today. <laughs> my my brother is in pastels. We, <laughs> we, yes. All right, Bram. Well, JP, today I wanted to talk about ambition, and, and this is one I've been asking you to come in and uh, and talk about, but you've probably been too busy. You've been too ambitious, chasing mm. a bunch of other stuff. You couldn't make time yeah, for me. you got to make that money, man. <laughs> but I got you here. And, and I just, I, I've appreciated the way I, I've watched you uh, both be ambitious and honor, honor God. And it's some really, really tricky uh, lines to kind of walk. And so um, I think just hearing your story, hearing your thoughts, uh, hearing uh, mistakes made will be really, really helpful to our listeners. So uh, I meet you the very first time. You are wearing a uh, yeah. really fancy suit, driving a really yeah. fancy car, wearing really fancy sunglasses. Yeah, not in ministry, <laughs> by not, the way. Not in ministry. And, uh, and then you end up coming on staff. Yeah. And so that had to have been a change. Uh, you're the same person in some respects, yeah. in some some ways different. So tell me about that shift. Tell me yeah. about ambition. How are you thinking about that now as a leader? Yeah, man. So uh, I was raised in a small town, 6,000 people in South Texas in the middle of nowhere and on a farm. And I, I watched my dad work really hard with his hands. He was just, a, I mean, a cattle rancher, surveyor, and I didn't want anything to do with that. I thought, man, I'm going to work smart. And so I went to school for as little as possible. I got out and I just learned, man, you can buy something and you can sell it for more and you can do it again. And I landed in corporate America and, you know, just through going through a series of interviews and landed in a global account manager position. And that that's not a flex. It was just like, that was, that was my drive. I was I was kind of everything wrong with Dallas personified. And I just thought, hey, I want to be a millionaire before I'm 30. I told in in multiple interviews, I would look at my boss and I would just say, hey, this is simple. Like this is me interviewing for the job. And I would just look him in the eyes and I'd say, hey, I want your job. And the way that I'm going to get your job is I'm going to get you promoted. And so I'm going to work hard underneath you. Man, we're going to bring in the sales. We're going to build the empire and you're going to get promoted. And when you get promoted, pull me up with you. And that's, that's the deal I'm willing to strike right now. And I mean, I said that in those words in multiple interviews. I still believe that. And I made, and I made good on it, you know, and I mean, it truly like the Lord allowed me to do that. And so, and, and by the way, just for the listeners, like this is in the, like the crossroads of my faith. So I became a believer in my early twenties and so like it, you know, in, in the, as I'm telling these stories, like I'm, I don't know the Bible. I'm, I'm a, I'm a very new Christian if I'm a Christian, you know, depending on where we're at in the story. And so it was just like the corporate ladder is a thing. There are rungs. I mean, there you go in there, there are politics in, in corporate America and it's, you know, who do you know and what are the positions that are open and navigating hiring freezes and, and just constantly trying to level up, as the cool kids would say, like, hey, how do we level up? How do we level up? And I was doing that, and then God did a work in my heart. He called me to know him. I, I went to church. I went, went to this church. I sat in the back row, hung over, smelt like smoke from the night before, wrestling with what do I believe about God, surrendered my life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to work in my life. And I've got this new lens that I see the world through, like a biblical worldview, and I'm wrestling with these ideas, you know, and I, I turn the scripture and it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I'm like, well, so what can I do out of selfish ambition? Oh, nothing. Well, what is selfish ambition? <laughs> How do I avoid that? Am I to like, am I to like not be ambitious? And and so I just was, rest. I was struggling. It was awkward. It was like a sweater that didn't fit. I'm like, man, how? so how do I work hard 
and, and what is, you know, what are my reasons? And, and in this, we're certainly going to camp out on the, the word motive. Yeah. And I'll just say this in, in transition. So fast forward five years, the Lord called me to vocational ministry. I'm not trying to over spiritualize that, but I find myself where I'm working for a church now. And it was like there was no ladder and there was no job that I wanted. There was nothing I was I was aiming for. I was it, it's like I was like I was had sat at the bottom of a ladder in corporate America and I'm climbing my way up. And then all of a sudden the Lord picked me up and he placed me in a room and it's filled with fog and I can't even see the walls, much less the door. And there's no way up. There's no way down. I can't see what's next. I can't see around the corner. And that was ministry for me. And and so then I, I would, I, you know, I met you and we had other friends and we would get together and you guys were so gracious just to be patient with me and help me learn the Bible. And and I can remember it seemed like early on the goal was church planning, and like every that was, you know that very, was like that was very like a, much a thing. It was yeah, it was like a, a thing back then for sure. It was everybody like if you were in ministry, you're the the end all be all was you planted a if church. You're ambitious, that's what you did. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, man, I don't really want to plant a church. Like I never that that was not a dream of mine. I don't want to plant a church. I want to share the gospel with people and and learn the Bible and you know, and I think that's a lot of times we have to figure out, all right, what, what do we have the crosshairs on? Like, what's the goal? What's the aim? And we can talk about that for a long time and it may be another podcast, but I don't know that we're going to improve on the word faithfulness. Hmm. Like the goal is every day you wake up and you're faithful and, and you measure success at the end of the day of what I was, was I faithful? You don't measure success on how many people got baptized, how many people became Christians, how many people filled the seats, how many people came to our event, how much money did we raise, are we in the green? You, you really have to measure success on the word faithfulness. And that was a lesson hard fought for. Tell me about that. So I, I remember you being both wanting to be really faithful, but you just had this chip in you that was so programmed mm-hmm. to excel and to drive hard and to do whatever the next thing was to set yourself up yeah. for the next thing. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So I'm, you know, faithfulness. I, I absolutely buy that, but tell me, tell me what that looks like, yeah. you know, brother, what, what are the decisions you're making? You could have just stayed obscure. You wrote books, mm-hmm. you know, you do podcasts, mm-hmm. you speak a lot of places and, and everyone from the outside would go, but that yeah. looks like ambitious. Yeah. It could also be faithfulness. So just, man, just yep. paint, keep painting the picture. Tell us what it's like to be you and the and the, the things that you wrestle with along the way. Yeah, let's 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 talk about ambition in ministry next in regards to growing a platform and writing books and and those kinds of things. But I'll just I'll say this here: everyone listening right now has to wrestle with the question of what is my motive. Uh, to say it in a different way, what drives me? Yep. And so I was a guy that you, if you, when we met that day, that event you're talking about, uh, I was what corporate America would call driven, and they would exploit that for their P and L, for their for their bottom line, and you know they I would I I would make money. They would make more money, and I would get a piece of the pie. And the more money they make, I get a piece of the pie. And and at that season of my life, like it was. If you would have said, hey, are you motivated by money? I would have said, no, I'm motivated by the deal and uh, and the money's nice icing on top because I like nice things, right? That, that was kind of what that looked like at the time. And so then I go into ministry and it was a big financial shift. And so we were dual income, no kids uh, to Monica got pregnant, said, hey, I really would like to stay at home. And I'm like, well, I think God's calling me to work for the church. <laughs> and so we, we, we came to work here and and now we're we're on a budget we're pretty strapped uh paycheck to paycheck and and i'm thinking all right what motivates me now and it was this really pure season of life if i'm honest yeah. like i look back yeah. on that and it was sweet yeah. because like god needed to be god meaning i don't know i can remember looking at our our, our budget together and i'm like man i don't know how that's going to work mm-hmm. and we were wrestling with things like hey we need to sell our house and and, um, you know, Hey, I'm not going to be able to buy you these kinds of gifts anymore. And just, Hey, are we all on the same page? Are we in this together? And, and, 
and that's what that looked like. And so I, I, what was I motivated by in that moment? I mean, I was motivated by faithfulness. I mean, I didn't even know it at the time, but it was like, hey, and they, you know, the church didn't call and say, hey, come and speak for us. Like it was like, you're over, we're going to try to, <laughs> we're gonna, you know, you're, you're really risky hire. You're going to be over small groups. We're going to teach you the Bible. You're going to help us, you know, do announcements here and there. And so that's happening for a long season and it's not about the money and, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of dying to those things. The Holy Spirit is doing that in me. And then what happens is one Tuesday, a couple of years in, I teach and they were like, Hey, can, wow, you know, we'd, we'd love for you to continue to teach. And so I'm like, great, I teach. And, and as I'm teaching and I'm watching a ministry grow and as the ministry grows, I'm being asked to speak other places. And, and then as I speak other places, you know, it's like, do this, this D now for $200, you know, or, and then those honorariums increased and you start to find worth in that. And it's like, wow, I, I can, I can, you can get paid really good money to do ministry. I thought I was, I grew up Catholic. And so, uh, uh priests take a vow of poverty. Mm-hmm. I, that was my only context. I thought, wow, you can actually make money doing ministry. And, and then I get a book deal. And I'm like, this is crazy. All of the sudden, all of those struggles that were there in corporate America are now there in ministry. And it doesn't have to be, we focused a lot on the financials, or I'm focused a lot on the financials. But what I see more than anything, even more than the money, is young men and women trying to heal some parent wound like they're they're trying to show their like for a lot of people it's like man my parents uh said hey i didn't send you to college so that you could play at your church you know and they're like i'm going to show you and they're trying really hard to get to a place that mommy and daddy would see them as significant mm-hmm. or to get to a place where you know they have a thousand followers on Instagram or to get to a place where their TikTok video goes viral or to get to a place where their um, their Sunday service was full or or their you know ministry event was full sold out you know, whatever that is. And so again, we're going to go back to that question, what motivates you? When this moment in the story, what is what is motivating me is is all of the old struggles. And so I go to my guys, John, so I, you know, like my, my small group. And I, and I ask them, I say, or I tell them, I'm like, guys, I sense some spiritual arrogance in me, like some, some selfish ambition in me. I said, would you guys pray for me? And they said, you know, sure. How would you want us to pray? I was like, man, I feel like God needs to wrestle me like Jacob. And I said, would you pray kind of Genesis 32, like just that, like Jacob's hip. Like I just sense God needs to wrestle me. And they said, sure. And so at 11, Oh nine, my, my birthday's November 9th. And so at 11 Oh nine, every day they started praying, you know, God would wrestle me like Jacob, which is the dumbest prayer request ever, man. Like, don't ever ask somebody to do that. I mean, I'm like two and a half weeks in. I'm speaking at this church in Austin. I'm driving back from there and Saddleback Calls on the West Coast, which was a big head check because at the time, like, that was, I mean, you know, that that was just like the place. And I was like, man, they want me to teach on, on Sunday. And, and, bro, like, my heart started skipping beats. Yep, I remember. Like, I was just, like, running too hard, too fast. Folk, I was I was cutting corners on my quiet time. Like there was no contemplative prayer in this season, and it was just go 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 do 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 more more more, and it cost me. I literally broke my heart. I mean I mean quite literally. I'm not talking about emotionally. I mean physically yeah. broke my heart, and and God taught me. I mean I was on the mat in that season, and he and he taught me a lot. And I I love this phrase: if dependence is the goal, weakness is the advantage. And so if faithfulness is the goal, then we have to stay in this place of dependence on God. Um, we can't try to do it without him. We can't run in front of him. And and we cannot do this thing called ministry for the wrong reasons. And so he kind of brought me back to that place. And it's an everyday struggle. Like I, I want to look and see how many followers I have on Instagram. Yep. I want to know where our podcast is ranking this week on Spotify. I want to know how many books I sold this week. And 
is nothing inherently wrong with knowing those things, but there is something very wrong with finding identity in those things. Yeah. And so every day, every single day, I have to lay that before the Lord and say, hey, search me, oh God, you know when I sit and when I stand. Because it, as it says in Luke 9, what does it profit a yeah. person to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? And, and that's failure. You know, if faithfulness is success, forfeiting your soul is, is yeah. massive failure. Okay. Is it getting easier or harder for you to kind of have ambition that you feel like is, uh, is holy or really is, uh, is motivated by faithfulness? Getting easier or harder for you in your journey? Man, it cycles. And the scariest answer to that question is the most honest and scariest answer is I don't know okay. because ambition is blinding and you don't always see it. And it's a mercy of God, a tremendous mercy of God when you feel it, when you sense it, you know, in, in kind of coming up, but you can, what we can, it's easier to measure. Am I content? You know, and, and the, you know, first Timothy six says godliness with contentment is great gain. And so am I, is my life marked right now by contentment? And if it's not, why? And these questions are what help us identify our motivators. And that's what we're trying to get a grip on is like, what is motivating me in this season? And if we come to a conclusion that we are motivated by the wrong things, we can't just look at it and do nothing. We have to kind of fire up the flare, you know, shoot up the flare. We have to raise the flag. We have to send the group text, say, hey, you know, that, that's when it's time to ask the crazy prayer. Man, I sense the Lord needs to wrestle me. I, I sense something needs to change. Hey, will you guys ask me about this? Because there's, there's something off in my heart. And this is a male and a female problem. It, it's like, what is our motivator? And... um I, I think it's cycles. I mean, I, I don't I don't look at a season where, you know, it, I can I can think about being motivated to get more and then I can think about being motivated to not lose what I have. Mm -hmm. And both of those can be a challenge at any given time rather than to say, all right, Lord, do with me as you please f for now, yeah. you know, for the moment. You read uh, Tale of Three Kings, yeah. uh, Gene Edwards? Uh -huh. How, I mean, what do you make of that? So it, it's a fantastic book. If you've not read it, I highly uh, commit it to you. You know, you've got three kings, you've got Saul, you've got David, you've got Absalom. And uh, the point of the book is, boy, you don't want to be, you know, like Absalom and try to sure. grab something. You don't want to be like Saul to try to uh, hold on to something. You want to be like David where you just trust God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every little kind of Christian subculture has got their own take on what that looks like in action. But uh, practically... I think most people would go, if I go and tend to sheep, you know, the prophet's not going to show up and he's not going to not declare me king. And I'm going to, you know, literally I'm going to, I'm going to tend sheep for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I think to be ambitious, to do something for God would be these steps. Mm -hmm. uh, and others would say, you know, no, you just, you literally, you tend sheep. And, and I think people, I, I just watch people. I, forget other people. I, I've been stuck on both. Like, Hey, this is up to me. Mm -hmm. I need to get this going or no, you know what? I would just bury my head mm -hmm. in faithfulness and obscurity. And if God wants to find me on, you know, if I'm Moses on the backside of the desert or I'm, I am taking care of the family sheep, he knows exactly where I am. Do you have any guidance on that? Like, yeah. 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 You know, and, and do I have any guidance? I've got dummy tax I've paid, but that's what I would say. Love you know, I, I would, I've got a story to tell. And so, so just we're kind of walking in this journey. So I'm on staff and again, I didn't come here to teach, but then I start teaching. And so like when I start teaching, it, it's almost like it, it fed the monster again, because like when I wasn't teaching, you know, there was, there's probably the most contentment I had in a long season where I was like, man, I don't know where this goes, but God, I'm just going to trust you. You know, I'm just going to trust you. Yeah. I start teaching and then all of a sudden, you know, this, not all of a sudden, but this thing in me was, was growing again where I was like, man, I'm just not content. And so here's what a lack of contentment looked like. There were, there were three things that I wanted. There was, there's, there's a 
group of leaders that would meet in this room and make decisions. Every day I'd watch them walk into the room, you know, and they'd be in there. And then I'd watch them walk out of the room and, and I'd hear about the decisions that were made. And I thought, you know what? I want to be in that room. Why not me? And so that was like the leadership team. So there was a le- I wanted to be on the leadership team. And I thought, you know what? Teaching on Tuesday, like that's cool, but I'd like to teach on Sunday more. Like it's some sort of like reoccurring, like let's, I'd love that to be official. And then I thought, you know what? This paycheck to paycheck thing, like I would love to make more money. And so those are the three desires. Like I, I'd love to be on the leadership team. I'd love to teach more and I'd love to make more money. And, uh, and so these, I mean, I'm, I'm really walking around with these, like this just kind of low hum of discontentment and thinking these three things, this is mm-hmm. what I want. And, um, the elders here called a meeting and invited me to it. And, you know, I had no idea, didn't know anything about it. They just said, Hey, can you be at this address at this time? And I was like, sure. I hope I'm not in trouble. I go. And, and I sit in the room and, and they say, you know, these, they say some encouraging things and they say, you know, you've been doing a good job. We see you, you being faithful. There's really, there's really three things that we want to do. Um, we would like to invite you on the leadership team. We think you'd have something to offer those conversations. And they said, and, and we would like you to take, you know, 30% of Sunday. We'd like you to teach more on Sundays um, and kind of make that official. And we'd love to give you a pay raise and, and pay you fairly for those additional responsibilities. And I was so like in the moment, like, whoa, everything I wanted was just handed to me. And John, I went outside and I got in my car. I was like parked on the curb in front of this house. And I turned it on and I sat there and I, you know, turned off the radio and I sat there in the car and I just started weeping, like, vi- like, like violently weeping, like, mm-hmm. like hyper, <laughs> you know, hyperventilating weeping, which is not normal for me. But I just had this really sober thought. It will never be enough. Mm-hmm. It will never be en- like, there's nothing that I don't have that if I just had, I'm, I'm, I can now shift into cruise control and be fine for the rest of my life other than Jesus which I'm saying that in faith, you know, I'm saying that because I know that to be true, but experientially I'm trying to fill that void with all of these things in this world. And so I think to go back to the three Kings, I think that you, you do see both of those problems between the young and the old. I think you see Saul's gripping the pulpit with, with both hands saying, Hey, I want to die here. And uh, I think you see Absalom's saying, man, when is that guy going to figure out that it needs to be me? And, um, and I do think we have to stay in this place of, all right, I don't want to crawl anywhere. Uh, I don't want to claw my way anywhere. Like the Lord has to be the strength behind me, pushing me a direction to a place. And everyone listening right now, it's almost like we need to be able to say, God, if this is it, yep. if this is it, it's it's enough. If I never make more, and if I never have greater responsibilities, and if no one ever notices, and my Instagram account is canceled, and you know my my books collect dust on shelf, and I've only disappointed publishers, and my podcast isn't listened to, it's enough. I'm yours. I've got an inheritance. Uh, I'll be with you forever. It's enough. Like, like what, what I have in you is enough. And it's a lot easier said than done, man. I can say that through this microphone today, but man, I'm going to struggle with it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So like, have, have you ever played that game? So you said, yeah, all your social media, your podcast, your books, and then also let's say the, uh, uh, the elders of Harris Creek, you know, they, they call a meeting and, uh, rather than promotion, they go, Hey, you've had a really good run here, bud. Yeah. And, uh, we think you're done. You lose that role. You lose, you know, the things that the accolades you get, in, and now, now the speaking engagements stop rolling in. Mm-hmm. What, what is well? And you can. This is probably turning into more of a podcast about con, um, contentment than ambition. 
But if you played that game, like what would you, what would you do? What does life look like for you? Mm-hmm. You know, Jonathan Bakluda, JP Bakluda. Yeah. If you have none of that, yeah. Uh, let me just say, I'm, I'm going to answer that. I'm not trying to uh, skate it, but do you, like do you think contentment is the other side of the coin of ambition? I don't know. Um, that's why that's why you're here, um, JP. That's why because <laughs> so I, I don't because I don't know because I don't know these things. Yeah. Um, I here's what I know about you is that you did not go, um, you know, and metaphorically hide on the backside of the mountain yeah. like like Moses and he found you. You you were here mm-hmm. and you worked your tail off. That's mm-hmm. what people probably don't see, you know, above the water line. They mm-hmm. just see you, you know, yeah. think you got lucky. Se- yeah. Seven foot five, you come rolling in here with your cool shoes and, you know, your um you know, uh, relevant illustrations. That's who JP is. Well I remember when you're preaching uh, was not that, mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, I could, I could pick some other adjectives, but I would just say it wasn't that. And I watched you work so hard, mm-hmm. like harder than I think I've ever seen anybody work mm-hmm. uh, on that craft. Mm-hmm. And you would, uh, you would prepare a message, you'd get feedback about your outline, then you would deliver it beforehand and, and you would, uh, invite people to give you feedback. And they, it like they bludgeoned you, mm-hmm. I remember. And then you would take that and then you'd give a message and then you would mm-hmm. ask for uh, feedback on the other side of that. And mm-hmm. I remember you driving around just trying to work out how to say things, you know, mm-hmm. with your iPhone, you would like actually record. I remember getting yeah. a couple uh, sound bites from you going, hey, this is the way I'm going to say this. What do you think? You know? yeah. And it was like incessant. Yeah. And and there's a lot, I, th- I think there was ambition sure. in that. Uh, you know, and so the question I have yeah. You know, I've never, I've never really been uh, completely uh, comfortable with the idea of uh, of ambition to yeah. get to something. But I think you, that's where you were yeah. headed, and um, so that's that's kind of really those are the questions I have. What does that even so, look like as a believer? So if we think about Philippians two three, you know, it, it doesn't say do nothing out of ambition. Um, he yeah. puts this this adjective, this descriptive, you know. To, a word to describe the ambition that we're not to do anything out of. And he says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. And I probably would argue that most everything we do is, is has some selfish ambition worked in there. So it's a sliding scale. It's not a black and white. It's not, this is selfish and that's not, it's everything has a little bit of selfish and, and other, or at least a little bit of selfish. And I think we're trying to say, so it's like do nothing out of selfish ambition and then if you were to like flip it on its head, it's almost like do everything out of kingdom ambition. Like is my, is my obsession the kingdom of God? Is my obsession the glory of God? It is ultimately like I think about John the Baptist. He's so faithful. He's a road sign. You know, he's just a road sign pointing to a savior. Like his whole life, like I mean his lot in life is, hey, you're, gonna, you're, you're just going to be proclaiming the coming Messiah and then you're going to have your head sawed off. But that that's that's what that's what faithfulness looks like to you. And so this that we would be motivated by this kingdom ambition. And it's messy, John, because listen, I've got a hundred thousand Instagram followers. And if a hundred thousand people follow me on Instagram, it means a hundred thousand people that I can point to Jesus. So I need them to follow me so I can point them to Jesus and I need more people to follow me, right? And we can play that game and all of a sudden the point them to Jesus can fall off and it just becomes the obsessive, well, I really just want them to follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. Oh yeah, yeah, so I can point them to Jesus. And it's a slippery slope of destruction and it's dangerous and uh, I don't think it's, you know, is to say, well, we should never go near it, Mm -hmm. you know? It is to say we need some guardrails as we go close to it. It, it is dangerous, yeah. and um, and so that that's it's like how do we stay in that place where our primary motivator is to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, trusting Him for everything else. Matthew six thirty three, and to go to your question now because I told you I wouldn't avoid it is if everything is erased, you know the dry erase board uh, mm-hmm. is, is erased tomorrow. Yeah. I hope I'm okay, and I'd probably lose my mind. You know, that's that's the reality. But I don't know, man. I hope the spirit of God would move. And it probably is going to have a lot to do with, you know, what kind of quiet time did I did I have for the past couple of weeks? You know, how, how much have I been strengthened in my heart with the word of God? How, how confident do I know this is true? Because if we operate in this this reality that I'm going to die and get an inheritance, the glorious riches forevermore in the presence of God, if I have a death grip on that, then there's a lot you can do to me under the sun that I can survive. But if my vision of that 
has has grown faint, it's become foggy, then then what you do to me under the sun really begins to hurt. And uh, and so I have to maintain this perspective of the kingdom that God is doing something much bigger than me. And I have a cameo in this movie, man. I'm on the scene for 15 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Okay. So you know what? I think we've, we've talked directly to the person who probably is uh, ambitious and they are in motion. Um, and in some ways the world is opening up to them, yeah. you know, whatever that looks like uh, for them. Yeah. There's, there's another person listening JP and above all else, um, man, they just want to honor God and they're paralyzed by, uh, Philippians two, and they don't want to do anything yeah. out of selfish ambition. So, um, they wait, uh, they're faithful. They've got all the fruits of the spirit and yeah. spades. Yeah. Um, but they also feel like they've got gifts that God's given them to build up the church and they don't know if they should, how they should, yeah. uh, take a next step. Yeah, man. And I, I just, again, I know I go, you ask a question and I ask a different question, answer a different question before I answer <laughs> you're that very, question. You're a very, very difficult guest. Well, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll say this. There's also, even if that's a sliding spectrum, there's someone past that person that is the professional Christian. Yeah. And so there's some, there's a lot of people in ministry that I see, they, they're like, man, I really liked church camp and it would be cool to get paid to go to church camp. Yep. You know, and and so they they just like, man, I can get paid to learn my Bible and have coffees with people and talk about Christ. And I'm like, man, that is not a job. That is that is that's what every believer does. Every follower of Jesus learns their Bible and they have coffees with believers. That's not what you're compensated to do. And so I think so I want to start there to say the other end of the spectrum is people have no kingdom ambition, right? And they're not using their gifts. And then you have someone who they want to have kingdom ambition, they have gifts, but they are afraid to use them out of selfish ambition. And I was like, man, you got to you got to do something, you got to do work, you know, like get after it and 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 consider faithfulness. The fact that I'm paid on the faithful tithes of people, meaning the faithful generosity of of church goers, you know, is, is man, it is uh, amazing accountability because hmm. I'm like I I know there are there are widows in our church that um, are working two jobs to to support their family and they're giving some percentage of that to the church and it fu- it's funneled to me you know in part to cover my salary and I'm like man I want to make sure that that person who believed that this is a great place to put those resources sees a kingdom return on that. And so to the person who's paralyzed by the thought of, I don't want to do anything out of selfish ambition, it's kind of the other extreme. It's like you, you've got to figure out how to get over that enough so that you can be driven by kingdom ambition to get a return on the gifts that you've been entrusted because God did, 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians, God did entrust gifts to you for the church. Yeah. And you want to use those gifts in the church to get a return for the church, a kingdom return for the church. So... I know that's like a really long way to say, man, get over yourself and get in the game. <laughs> okay. That's a good, well, that's good. I, I think, I do think the church hurts both ways. Yeah. Uh, one, if you don't use your gifts yep. and you play this humility, uh, sometimes even falsely, uh, which we candidly we can hide behind. Mm-hmm. We, it can be fear that we don't lean into our gifts or two, you make it about you yep. and, uh, and you, uh, you have a, so you do are, you are ambitious, but you're a selfish a uh, selfish person in the way that that executes. And I was looking up quotes um, today for, on ambition, and uh, I'd never heard this one, but it's, I think it's fantastic. Uh, Elvis Presley, uh, of all things, uh, and he said, ambition is a dream with a V8 engine. And we might say uh, ambition is a vision with a V8 engine. Mm-hmm. It, ta- it takes some drive. It, if you want to get, uh, if you feel like God is supposed to uh, use or God wants to use you uh, to be a communicator, you're going to have to work really hard. You're going to have to put a V8 engine in that thing and fire it up and go. You're going to have to mash the gas pedal. Um, But that does not mean, that does not mean that fundamentally it is about you. Uh, And if you can, I think if you can see it as uh, service to others, uh, faithfulness uh, to God, then, uh, then you can you can hit the pedal all the way to the floor yeah. and let that whatever it is that God's put in your heart or the uh, God's put in your your church's heart or you know, whatever it is that you're attached to. Um, I, I think I think that's what God intended yeah. uh, for us, but it's really really tricky yeah. because our hearts are so wicked. 
yeah, and I would just say, breathe easy, standing on the promises of God that He's, you know, He who started a good work in you is going to finish it, going to carry it out to completion, and the the good works that you that He wants to do through you have been determined before creation. So you've been created for Ephesians two ten. You've been created in Christ yeah. Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for you to do or for you to walk in. And so, like, you're just walking faithfully through the works that God has determined ahead of time. But it does require you to put one foot in front of the other. I love Colossians 1.29. I strenuously contend with all his strength at work in me. So it's Christ's strength. He's the V8 engine. Jesus is the V8 engine. Jesus is the driver. Jesus is the motivator for us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And we're in, in, in it's like we're strenuously contending, but but he's he's the power inside of us. And so it, it comes down to me to these two questions. What does God want to do with your life? Uh, to say in a different way, a little less big, how does God want to deploy your gifts in his church? Whether you, you're employed by the church or you're a lay leader, how does God want to deploy your gifts in his church? You should consider the answer to that question. And then why are you going to do that? Is it, are you able to maintain a posture of it's because I want the biggest kingdom return from the gifts that God entrusted to me and I don't need the glory. Our soul was not made for the glory. I think when we seek out the glory, what happened to me will happen to so many of you that we'll get crushed underneath it. But if we are able to offload that glory onto the sturdy shelf of Jesus Christ, like John the Baptist, we're able to point to him in, in all using all the gifts that he's given us to point to him, then I think that's the path of success. That's the path of faithfulness. So good. Brother, I want you to know I appreciate you when I think yeah. about, uh, you know, it's really helpful if you can have models yeah. uh, of people who are trying to live this out, and you're one of the ones yeah. that I think of. And so uh, God used you to kind of get me off the dime and get in, in motion yeah. uh, as well as to kind of check uh, check my ego yeah. and, uh, and just want to be faithful and uh, leave all the results up to uh, to him. So you're one of the you're one of the men that God's used, and I've seen you live this out. I've seen you wrestle. Uh, you're not perfect, but um, yeah. but I really appreciated watching the wrestle, uh, brother. Thank you. Thank you, man. Likewise, I appreciate you and all that you're doing to equip the church, guys. Listen, follow me here and forward this. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, uh, JP. We didn't talk about this, but you got a new book uh, that just just released. Yeah. It's doing amazing. So talk about that, and then also where uh, it people doesn't. Can... It doesn't. I can't on the tail end of that, man. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's 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 stuff out there. You guys read it if it's a blessing. If not, no big deal. But no, it's I love it, man. Thanks for having me on, and I'm just I'm glad to be with you, bud. Yeah. So the book is uh, Why Do I uh, Do What I Don't Want to Do? Yeah, and, plagiarize uh, that title. That is uh, that is JP's uh, book. You can find him on all the socials and uh, listen to um, his podcast that he has at Harris Creek uh, called Becoming Something, and then also uh, just some great sermons uh, every week uh, at Harris Creek Baptist Church. So um, JP, I don't think we've ever done this on uh, CLP, but uh, would you end by praying yeah. for uh, the listeners? Yes. God, would you protect us? There was once an angel who was selfishly ambitious, who became the prince of darkness, and his spirit is in the world. And he would love to pull us down with him. Uh, he would love to grow in us a selfish ambition so that we would not worship you as God, but we would fight to make ourselves like God. Uh, that we would want to be worshipped. And, uh, Father, would you just strip us of that? Would you protect us from that? Would you keep us in a place where we are servants? Uh, we're not trying to get in a room for authority and autonomy, but we are trying to figure out how to leverage what you've given us to serve. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I pray that would be the spirit that you grow in our hearts, uh, that we would be content and uh, that we would use um, any gifts you've given us to to maximize a kingdom return for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you, JP. Friends, thanks so much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, we can always be reached at clp at watermark.org. That's clp at watermark.org. We'll talk to you again next time.